Good afternoon and welcome to Lunchtime Series with Kevin, where we add value to people's lives happening every day at 12 on ebizradio.com. Joining me again for our marketing segment is marketing and communications expert, Craig Page Lee. Hello, Craig, how are you doing? I'm well, Kevin. Yeah, good to be chatting again. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, last week uh, uh, we, we actually were speaking about the, the remote working situation, which I was completely uh, chatting to you on, on a houseboat <laughs> in the middle of a river. Um, so it was quite uh, quite apt for the conversation we were having. Fantastic. Um, and, you know, uh, for those who actually missed the show, we, we actually discussed the, the future of work. Um, and Craig, you were providing us with some really interesting insights on where to next for organizations. So don't you, to, to kick off today, don't you want to give us some points or tips from last week that we can share with uh, anyone that wants to check it out uh, or find out more about what we chatted about? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I, I have to say that I thoroughly enjoyed our chat last week because um, the future of work really does impact on just about everyone who's listening to the show podcast yep. today. Um, and it's a topic that's going to be relevant for a very, very long time because businesses still have to understand how they reform and reformat themselves into the future as well. One of the reports that we discussed last week was, was a report that covered the nine future work trends. And I'm quickly going to list those, but in, in doing so, there's three three other important points that we really need to be cognizant of because that is what's going to impact all of us moving forward. So, so yeah. the nine future work trends that, that we covered were more remote workers, increased use of employee data, greater role for the employer as a social safety net, bringing the, the human aspect in there, which was really great, wider use of freelancers and contract work in this new gig economy, also got some negatives to it, critical yeah. skills no longer being synonymous with roles, some finding work more humanizing while other finding it more dehumanizing. And I think we picked up on quite a bit of that in our mental health and wellness uh, session as well. Yeah. The focus on crisis response as it distinguishes top tier employer brands, uh, prioritizing resilience as much as efficiency, and adding strength to employee engagement, culture, and value proposition. And for me, that really is, 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 a, is a key into those points and the segue into the, the three that I want to expand on a bit on. So the three yeah. important themes that we covered, Kevin, were productivity can occur anywhere, not just in the office. And uh, interesting, yeah, the remote workers were more engaged and had better workplace experience than office workers had before COVID-19. Positive takeout is, though, that during COVID, there was a gradual increase in team collaboration um, and this really only been achieved through through the use of really great remote collaborative technologies and software programs. Number two, flexibility and choice to work from anywhere is accelerating. But the concern here again is the human connection and social bonding are suffering. Again, a point we picked up on, uh, impacting on the connection to corporate culture and learning. A major concern here is that younger generations are reporting more challenges with work from home something we touched on in the mental illness piece as well and yeah, yeah everybody is is really surprised by that because the the younger particularly gen z quite independent shaping their world around them and and really choosing their path of the guys that are feeling the pressures of this lack of uh, um partnering just being in an environment with somebody to to get a bit of information guidance and assistance it's, it's a tough one for them yeah. And then point three, the optimum way forward will be a total workplace ecosystem. One, where the workplace will no longer be a single loco location, but an ecosystem. An ecosystem of a variety of locations and experiences to support convenience, functionality, and well-being. And the purpose of the office will be pr to provide inspiring destinations, really great, great thought that, that strengthens cultural connection, learning, bonding with customer and colleagues, and one that supports innovation. So to conclude that section, Kevin, it's, it's important to note that the findings are, to a large degree, identical from across the world to, to those in South Africa, with many employers and employees sharing similar expectations and concerns. Uh, and for me, that means that there's definitely going to be some kind of global recalibration or fundamental shift in how organizations are structured and how work is created and delivered in, in, in the not too distant future. And I'm incredibly excited about that because as I mentioned last week again, from a spatial point of view, from a workflow point of view, and then the organizational 
dynamic point of view, there really is going to be a recalibration. And, and I look forward to being part of that, I must tell you. Absolutely. Thank you, Craig. I, I, I tend to agree. I, I think uh, that there's a long way still to go for, for a lot of and a lot of effort required in defining what the ultimate organizational structure will look like in the coming up uh, or coming out of the pandemic, at least. Um, so with that said, what what can we expect from today's conversation? Yeah, Kevin, thanks. So, so I wanted to continue the conversation into what that looked like from a client agency relationship point of view and what the impact on the agency world was. And as I, as I took on the task, I realized the enormity of, of what it requires to build out the research document, the questionnaire. Um, I've created a list of about 50 contacts in the industry and, and there's quite a bit more work that I have to do to get through that. So, so what I thought is, is to pick on something that is quite contentious and, and a lot of people really wonder where the value is and that is the topic of influences in marketing for our discussion today. <laughs> well, Craig, that, that's great. That, and we've often touched on the subject, and I remember you specifically mentioning influences when we focused on the 2020 visibility report published by Brandwatch, um, in which uh, we spoke about in, uh, earlier in the shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, that's right. Brandwatch used an amazing technology. They, they've got their image insights technology, which they were searching uh, tweets over a six month period, and they were identifying logos that were present within images within those tweets. Um, and you may recall that about 40 million images were identified for that period in question. And that Nike and Adidas were the top two brands that, that ranked in that study. But, but for me, this is the exciting bit. Um, uh, influencers were also identified by then searching names associated with the images where the logos or the top brands appeared. And, and it wasn't a case of searching by name because you know the person was searching to establish whose names were attached to the highest ranking images in, in a social context. And there was an unexpected high number of unknown advocates for many, many of the brands. Um, and these, these guys were, were sharing, wearing, and referencing key brand logos, particularly DJs at key events and things like that. And, and you know, they, there was a, a whole new generation of new influences that spawned out of that particular exercise. So that, that kind of tracking, the importance there is that it, it allowed the brands to measure the impact of their current influencer relationships, as well as identifying the opportunity for future partnerships with advocates of, of uh, brands that they may not have come across at that particular point. Yeah, I, I remember that. And um, uh, 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 with, with that in mind, are you able to give us some, some context around the topic of influencers and marketers and brands uh, and uh, need to be aware of when using influencers? Because I think the, um, uh, when, you, when, you, when you mentioned this uh, the first time around as well, um, it was interesting, interesting to, to me to see that, you know, this was such a, a thing that people were starting to do, especially with, you know, brand watch, um, uh, yes. the info that we got from that. Yeah. 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 So, so I'll just start by, by a bit of context and referencing a really great, simple website that I came across that provided some clear ideas on the topic. So Kanuka Digital is a web design and digital marketing agency that um, an international agency that spawned out of their parent agency, uh, who's the e-commerce expert iWeb, which you probably have heard of. And, and their web, website contains a really great post entitled Influencer Marketing Tips for Success, which goes on to state that influ influencer marketing is one of the fastest growing marketing tactics with studies showing that 40% of consumers have already purchased something after seeing it advertised through someone who they follow on YouTube or Twitter. Yeah, that's unreal, 40%. Yeah, yeah that's just that's, that's crazy. Just, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Their, their definition is, is really great. It's simple. Influencer marketing is the promotion of a brand or its products through the use of individuals, namely influencers, whom have influence over potential customers. And obviously there are a lot of them doing it well to the point that 40% of uh, you know, users and listeners and social media are purchasing through, through that. Um, yeah. But a, a, few, a few points to remember here, Kevin, is that the brands really need to know who they're working with. They need to understand what the influencers are good at, where they fall short, 
um, just so that they can really ensure that the brands are getting best value for their money because there are a lot of scam influencers out there, guys who bought uh, uh, um, viewership and things like that, but we'll get into a bit of that in detail. So, yeah, on that, note, I, Rick, yeah. Sorry, but on that point, um, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but mm. the, uh, it's true. You know, I've, I've actually been one of those people who, uh, who fell for someone promising me great followers and uh, uh, interest on, on, on my Instagram. And I was like, okay, well, like, because I want to, you know, when I started out with Instagram, I wanted more people to sort of know what I was doing. Um, and they are, they are actual scammers that, that promise a whole bunch of followers and insights on your, on your Instagram and it actually doesn't work. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to hear more about yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big issue, but there, let me take you through the five quick tips, um, from, from the, the site that'll really help marketers plan and run successful Instagram campaigns, Kevin. So number one is define your target audience and <laughs> like with the e-commerce and some of the other topics we discussed. Brands have to have a clear idea of their goals and target audience profiles when planning their campaigns. And in, influencer campaigns are no different. And they, they're effective for increasing brand awareness, reach and engagement, or generating revenue and leads. And as such, obviously, you need to really know who you're talking to. So for brands, if the goal is to increase brand awareness, reach, or engagement, they should measure the impressions, likes, comments, and shares. If for brands, the goal is lead generations. Influencers can be asked to share links to the brand, the product, or the service, and those are the great to reach, obviously, a bigger opportunity to, to get the brand out there. If the goal is revenue generation, brands can then create custom affiliate links for each of the influencers, and you can very clearly identify where that link has gone, who's engaging with it, and get to understand more of the click-through rates and, and, and revenue opportunities on the on the back of that. Yeah. So yeah, so so yeah, as I mentioned, we've covered covered the topic of target target audience uh, quite frequently in the various conversations. And in this instance again, brands need to think about the audience age, demographics, interests, locations, and and more just to make sure that the campaign reaches the right people. And it'll also help with, with that clear understanding in place, it will definitely help brands identify with the right influencer for their brand, particularly influencers that, that share similar interests and parallel behaviors and, and the likes to, to the brands in question. Yeah. Point two, thoroughly research your influencers. So brands, and, and here's, here's where we talk about the, the fake points. So, so brands really should research the prospective influencers thoroughly as there are a number of fake influencers out there. And the fake influencers buy followers, they buy likes, and they, they, they comments to sort of inflate follow accounts and engagements. But actually, the brand's just paying for nothing because there's vaporware on the back end there. Yeah. That has a negative consequence for brands is there's really no real audience and it's, it's a wasted investment at the end of the day, as exactly as you've alluded to. Yeah. Choose, choose quality over quantity. Brands must choose influencers with a high quality engaged audience to match their defined target audience interests instead of selecting an influencer just with a large follow account where, you know, 60% of the follower actually may have zero relevance to the brand in question. So when selecting influencers to work with, brands must remember that it shouldn't be about who has the largest following, but rather who has the highest engaged audience, most important, as these are the influencers who really have an impact on their followers. And brands are better off working with a few influencers with highly engaged audiences than those few influencers with big mass audiences where there's no traction or engagement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't be afraid to give up some control. And I think this is, this is a real test for, for brands because unlike traditional marketing, where brands have total control over creative and how it's distributed, influencer marketing really relies on authenticity of influencers. So, you know, each influencer will obviously have a different approach to showcase a brand or a product that they're working with. And as such, brands really need to be comfortable in handing over some of the control to those influencers. But brands should also recognize that the influencers that they work with will have a better understanding of what resonates with their followers. A really important point there, Kevin. And thereby allowing them to exercise their creativity and how they approach the brief and, and connect with, with their respective audiences. 
So, so just on that point, Craig, um, so d does that mean because you've done enough research, because you've really, you really understand your audience, you really understand who the influencer is talking to, you would probably have more, um, you would feel better about uh, letting go of that control a little bit more based on the fact that you've actually done your homework. So, so for, for a brand, what they're seeing is that the influencers have a stickiness with consumers or followers, which the brand doesn't necessarily have with consumers yet. So leveraging the stickiness that the influencers have with their followers, particularly the followers that have similar interests and similar behavioral aspects to the brand's expectation, the brands are then handing over more brand control to the influencer, bringing in the video and all of those kinds of things. So, so yeah. The, the the risk there is that they hand over too much control and actually there's brand damage because the influencer actually isn't carrying the brand to the brand guidelines and the same tonality and all the rest of it may actually behave in a particular way that negates what the brand stands for. So there's there's always that that challenge at place. But but when you've identified the right influencer, they got the right audience, they got the 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 stickiness that you that you after you're comfortable enough to trust that influence and hand some of those controls over to, to the individual. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then point five there is, is build long-term influencer relationships. And I think this is a, is a perfect segue out of the last point I made that trust really is the enabler to building those long-term relationships. Because in the past, it was a quick campaign, you know, go and find the influencer with the biggest audience, drive and get, get that influencer to expose your brand and actually not really get traction, pay them and move on. Whereas now, the, the ones with sponsored posts are, are in essence a thing of the past and, and brands definitely need to focus on building long-term relationships with their influencers. And as a brand, it means that the influencer is more invested in the brand as well and they can work better with the brand in producing high quality content. For the influencers, the long-term brand relationship shows that the brand trusts them, the point I mentioned earlier, and, and opens up new collaboration opportunities in that regard. Yeah, Craig, I, I, like, as you mentioned, I definitely didn't appreciate like, the, or understand the, the, the effort required in selecting the right influencers for, for a brand. Which, with that understanding in place, what can you tell us about the actual trends driving brand use of influencers? Yeah, okay. Yeah, Kevin, there are a hell of a lot of trends. And, and as I you know, do in each instance, I, 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 covered, I covered about 10 different articles and reports um, in, on, on this particular topic. And I've created my own little ranking of those 10. So let me, let me give you the 10 trends that I've tabled. Um, brands are looking for deeper long-term ongoing partnerships and collaboration instead of one-off projects, the very point we've just covered. Yeah. Influencers are becoming more specialized with micro and nano influencers on the rise. And we're definitely going to see a greater share in the marketing budget go to this. And, and you picked up on, on that particular topic as well. Brands are definitely putting more time and effort and strategy into their planning and understanding the data than ever before. And as such, we, we, we definitely see brands putting a bit more investment into paid for advertising for increased reach, which is good for the influencer at the end of the day as well. Uh, important to note here that, that, that the deeper level of data understanding, brands are also in a much stronger position to start implementing performance-based measures uh, with their influence. So something that hasn't really been top, top priority for brands. Video content increasing in popularity with short form video becoming a key priority. New forms of influencer media evolving, specifically social media platforms like the, the hot topic we always reference, TikTok. These yeah. will continue to evolve and bring uh, their own take on, on, on influencer content. Social comment, uh, commerce, a great topic that we've covered already. Uh, and shoppable content is definitely driving new sponsorship opportunities. And, and I'm going to unpack that a little bit more later. The focus is shifting to the collective good and brands are taking a stance such as cause and, and issue marketing that will absolutely continue to grow. Um, but again, it's important to know that it's a two way priority and conversation because whilst brands are expecting influencers to, to behave and represent their brands in a particular way, influencers most definitely are looking to align with brands that also represent their ethos, philosophy and, 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 and beliefs. Authenticity and more real content will continue to be a priority, particularly for Generation Z. 
And a real great emerging trend is how brands are aligning with employees as influencers, as employee-driven content can really help brand advocacy. And again, this point can play so nicely into the future of work aspect as well, because different environments bring about different engagements with brand and therefore the employee driven content can be quite different from one environment to the next and one experience to the next. Yeah. yeah and last but not least, there, there's a move away from heavy, heavy platforms, heavy image platforms like the Instas and the photos and Facebook and things like that to, to other ways of engaging with audiences like we're doing now actually podcasts, Kevin. Yeah. Craig, so I'm aware of some of the trends that you are mentioning, uh, but I have to ask the nano and micro influencers, because uh, I often hear about them, so, but really don't know what they do and what, they, what value they, they bring to brands. Can you help us understand a bit more, uh, more in detail around the, the nano and micro influencers? Yeah, Kevin, uh, an important question relative to, to that one key trend that, that is a particularly fast growing aspect for, for, for brands to associate with. So let me start off by referencing an article from I'm a social blog uh, titled Nano Influencer or Micro Influencer, What's the Deal? Um, Emma Social is a business that tracks social media ROI by various profiles, ad handles, campaign phrases, hashtags, all of the, the requirements in ensuring you get elevation and, and stickiness in social media. Um, and their blog provides a simple definition that addresses the differences between the two terms, Kevin. So I don't know if you knew this, but nano influencers have between 1,000 and 5,000 followers on their social media accounts. Yeah. Um, and, and the look and the feel of their content really comes across as real and in the moment. There's, there's no superficial nonsense and glitz and high-touched editing and, and the likes in there. It's real, genuine, and engaged with, with, with their followers. Micro-influencers have a slightly, um, slightly larger following than the nano-influencers, but most of the time they're sitting between the five and 10,000, probably closer to the 10,000 spectrum. So still, you know, for some brands, 10,000 followers is a lot, but there's yeah. some there's some influencers, you know, there are two women in in America in particular who've got half a million followers, um, and and they they talking to half a million audiences every single day. But key is is both nano and micro influencers small following means that they're able to develop more personal relationships, and and for me that was an important point to make here: more personal relationships with their followers unlike those celebrity counterparts that I, that I mentioned. Um, and yeah, they generally don't have a real connection with their followers and it's impossible for anybody who's got 20, 30, 100,000, 500,000 followers to have any form of relationship. And nano and micro influencers are often considered to be experts in a niche field or interest genre. And they therefore able to target small specific audiences with high marketing potential as people trust their advice very important for brands. Absolutely, yeah. Craig, there are so many new terms and concepts that we've been hearing today, and, and thanks for helping me understand some of this, um, between, especially, especially between the nano and micro influencers. Um, <laughs> I, might, I might be a nano influencer. <laughs> <laughs> Keep doing what you're doing and you're going to a macro. Here we go. Um, but going back to your list of 10 influencers and marketing trends, uh, are you able to give us some uh, a bit of more information on what each of these trends means to to marketers out there? Yeah, yeah. Again, good good question because you really need to understand the layers behind each of the trends to see where where the relevance is. So so let's let's expand on the ten trends. So picking up on the first again, that that was brands are looking for deeper long term, ongoing partnerships and collaboration instead of those once off uh, projects with influencers. So. In an effort to maintain genuine influencer partnerships and keep loyal, high-performing influencers on their sides, brands are switching from one-off campaigns to the creation of influencer communities and ambassador programs. And that's bringing the, the influencers into the realm of the brand, into its philosophy, into its culture, and into its inner circle. And, and again, as more data becomes available, brands will quickly be able to identify who those ideal candidates are in the influencer community that suit their brand in, in, in question. Point number two, brands are becoming more specialized with micro and macro influencers. 
they are on the rise and will see a greater share in the marketing budget go their way. So we covered this point earlier, Kevin, but it's worth mentioning that the micro influencers can be great for small or local businesses as well, as they typically have limited reach and they're also much more affordable to, to work with. Um, and it's easy to find influencers with niche audiences that align well with brands' target audience. And these influencers definitely tend to have a higher engagement with their respective audience. And irrespective of how low the, the investment is from a brand, there's probably a higher ROI in that regard as well. Yeah. Point three, brands are putting more time, effort, strategy into planning and understanding data than ever before and are putting more money into paid advertising for increased reach. So it's important to note that with this deeper level of data understanding, brands are also in a stronger position to implement performance-based deals with influencers. And the rise of paid amplification for influencer content is, is really built on the back of the ability to get hyper-targeting at delivery across a multitude of social media platforms, thereby allowing brands to reach a larger qualified audience. Mm. Point four, video content is increasing in popularity with short form video becoming a key priority. It's obviously a trend that we've all expected to emerge, Kevin, as more people are watching video online than ever before now, and especially brought on by, by COVID. These videos are accessed via the likes of Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram Reels. And again, a, a you know, interesting stat we saw that in the USA in the early stages of the pandemic, there was a 50% increase in Facebook users watching live video. Now, that's a substantial increase. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's yeah. a lot. And, and brands are benefiting by allowing the influencers to create their own content, in which most instances increases the authenticity and attractiveness for the brands. And again, a point we, we, we picked up on earlier. Point five, new forms of influencer media, specifically social media platforms like TikTok, will continue to evolve and bring their own take on influencer content. So, yeah, Kevin, brands are definitely already using the more informal platform that we all refer to and know as TikTok. Um, and interesting for me, I think TikTok may even be upending Instagram in, in some instances as the favorite influencer marketing platform. Yeah. TikTok's got an incredible simplicity to it, but the technology has got unique filters and presentation styles that, that allows just about anybody to become a, a creative and content creator. And the benefit here for brands, again, is that the platform makes it easy for the content to reach a broad audience. And, and I know you like these large stats because TikTok currently is reporting an active audience in excess of 850 million active users a month, Kevin. Sure. <laughs> and that's different to, to, to just signing up to a, a platform because a lot of platforms have a lot of signups and they have a lot of, uh, you know, I, I think of, I mean, Facebook's been around for how long already and they, they have a, 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 what, one or two billion users already? Yeah. But, you know, when you're having 800 million active users, that's, that's a whole different ballgame. That's right. And, you know, that is, that is high level engagement. And that's the great thing about the platform for brands, for the right brands, again, going back to one of our earlier conversation, for the right brand in the right moment, the right place, TikTok definitely does have relevance. Yeah. Point number six, social commerce and shoppable content is definitely driving new sponsorship opportunities. And I'm, I'm a big fan of this. So users are spending up to four hours a day watching video content with live e-commerce solutions evolving at a rapid place. And you know, there's a great opportunity for influencers to be at the heart of all of that. Um, the likes of uh, Amazon Live created, they bring together shopping and streaming. And the, the platform is a live feature that transforms content creators into effectively fully fledged TV personalities. And uh, yeah, you, you, you can think of the uh, gosh, what are the South African shows? The one that's wait, there's more, you know, where where you <laughs> yes. you have your 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 product showcase shows and individuals take on that role and they actually get immersed in the experience of boxing, opening yeah, the layers of packaging, the story behind the brands, et cetera, et cetera. So, so definitely a, a really great opportunity to showcase that. And the number of immediate clicks and buys coming out of those platforms is, is overwhelming. It really, really is. Yeah. Point seven, focus is shifting to the collective good and brands are taking a stand as such cause and issue marketing will continue to grow. 
2020s, we saw an increase in social activism, uh, spotlighted in the lack of diversity in influencer marketing as well, um, and inequality faced by black content creators. That's definitely something that, that brands are looking to, to work with and fix and be more selective and participative in, in the approach to identifying uh, influencers. And many brands are now being held accountable for tokenism and unfair play and a lot of the content creators we're vocal about uh, really is, is is driving that aspect of the market, which again, the, the power of the influencers is able to voice the frustrations that they're facing. So good for the influencers and great for the brands who who towing the line and, and being more embracing. Yeah. Point number eight, authenticity and more real content will continue to be a priority, especially for our beloved Gen Z. Gen Z have grown up with smartphones and social media literally embedded into the palm of their hands and nearly half of them have made a purchase on an influencer's suggestion. Gen Z is also a consumer powerhouse and here's again another great figure stat with spending or really estimated at close to a hundred billion US dollars. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to marketing to, to the Gen Z, they should be recognized for the unique characteristics. They tend to be drawn to quality over quantity, and I like that about them uh, in social media. And they value individual, individual expressions, and above all, they prefer brand authenticity and companies that are transparent about their stance and social causes. You know, and it's, 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 it's something that many, many of the older generations just need to learn from Generation Z in this regard, because these are incredibly important aspects of moving this world forward in, in the right way. Point number nine, a really great emerging trend is how brands are aligning with employees as influencers, as employee-driven content can really help build brand advocacy. As employees are your first line of connection with customers, they can be an untapped source of valuable content and nobody knows your brand better than the people who are part of it. As such, brands have now started to use collective voices of their clients and employees to improve brand visibility. They encourage buyers and workers to use brand specific hashtags to improve the visibility on the market product and services. Um, and this is effective because content shared by company employees typically receives eight times more engagement than content shared directly through the brand. Important point to note that. Yeah. And Kevin, yeah, last, last but not least here is that there's a move away from, from the heavy image platforms to other ways of engaging with the audiences. And, and again, you're going to love some of the, the, the content here. So the immediate default when thinking about influencer marketing, we think Instagram, possibly TikTok. Um, but in reality, there are many more other platforms for, for influencers to engage with. And, and this is where the move is away from the heavy image-based platforms, um, obviously being replaced with video, definitely driving a lot of that. But we're seeing the migration into audio platforms such as Spotify. And as I cited an example early on, the likes of podcast, our very own podcast series. Uh, so why Spotify? Well, over 300 million active monthly users, Kevin, over 4 billion playlists, and over 700 million titles. It's obvious that yeah, Spotify is, is a choice for influencer environments, and it's considered the largest audio platform, and therefore has to be seen as a destination for anything audio. And just to add to that, uh, Craig, um, guys, if you are listening to this, we are on Spotify. You can go and check it out. It's Ebers Radio on Spotify, and you can check all the, everything Craig and I speak about every Thursday. <laughs> yeah, that's a great little uh, slide in there. That's quite right, yeah. <laughs> but thank you, Craig. Uh, so in terms of uh, everything that you've shared with us, yes, yeah, so, um, what are the tips that you can share with, with the listeners today around everything that we've chatted about? Yeah, Kevin, as I mentioned earlier, quite a broad but important topic. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I'll just pull a few few tips. Um, let, me, let me look at them. So, when brands choose an influencer for their social marketing strategy, they need to take the following into account. Consider what sort of subjects the influencers cover, as well as their areas of expertise, and make sure that it aligns with the brand. Check yeah. how often they post online. Yeah, beat the fakes. You want to choose an influencer who posts regularly enough to keep audiences engaged and interactive, 
but not too often that the posts just get lost amongst the noise. And you know that that's an important point for anything on social media. Yeah. Look into the kind of people who make up the following. Ensure that you share a similar target audience. Identify how much follow interaction your potential influencers have on their social platforms. And the more followers that interact with the influencers post, the more reach your posts are going to have. So key point there. Ensure you pick an influencer who has authority in their niche and is always authentic and honest in their posts. And again, that's the perfect brand fit. Um, create content that aligns with the influencer you've chosen. They're more willing to publish content that relates to their specific tastes which gives your content a greater chance of being shared. And uh, make sure that the influencer's approach is passive when it comes to marketing a product. And the more subtle mentions of the product will inform followers as opposed to pushing them away. Absolutely, I love that, Craig. So, you know, just in my kind of final thoughts of, of today's conversation, um, you know, part of, um, I don't know if you know Gary Vee? Yes, Gary yes, 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 yes. He often speaks about his social media and what people should be doing. And, um, uh, you know, if, if you go on YouTube, some of the stuff that he spoke, spoke uh, uh, some of the stuff he shares, really, um, he's been speaking about the influence of how LinkedIn um, has become the next Facebook kind of platform for people to go, specifically businesses. But also he's, you know, he's been uh, the, the almost like a the insight of, of marketing and what people are really starting to do. Um, and a couple of years ago, he's already mentioned, you know, the importance of how audio uh, and audio platforms are going to be taking over a large part of what people are doing and how people are marketing content. Yeah. So like I, you know, and, and the, the fact that you mentioned today, nano and micro influencer, I'm like, I'm still going to like check all the numbers of my, <laughs> 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 where, where am I sitting here? What do I need to do to become a, a nano or micro influencer? But um, Craig, thank you. I, I think it's uh, it's such a valuable insight that you've given, uh, especially marketers li listening and, and really just wanting in some insights. And also, you know, small smaller businesses that, that really want to impact and start uh, understanding a little bit more about marketing. I think that's going to add huge value to to what they're doing. Yeah, but thanks, Kevin. I just want to pick up on the, the LinkedIn piece. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting, we, we'll definitely, I'll, I'll select it as a topic for deeper investigation soon. Um, because yeah. there, there's a lot of things from Facebook that have found their way into LinkedIn that in a way have taken away some of the professionalism of LinkedIn for me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, we're, 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 we're all questioning the value of likes in a, in a social media space and Facebook in particular, that is now creeping into LinkedIn. And yeah, so, so for me, it's lost a bit of its conversation and it's gone to more of a tacit approval kind of thing, which is, is, is something I'm still needing to get my head around nevertheless. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it would be a fantastic conversation to have because I think people sometimes, because everyone's kind of jumping on the bandwagon going, yeah, LinkedIn is the next best business option for you, or at least connection option for you. Uh, we tend to post and share stuff that, are, that has got nothing to do with business. Correct. And you're saying, okay, so I'm sort of losing the point. Why are you sharing this? Yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely. It would be fantastic to, to chat yeah, about that. I'd, I'd like that. We'll, we'll pick up on that definitely. So in terms of what we have lined up next uh, in our next week uh, conversation, what's what's happening? Yeah, yeah, quite a quite an interesting topic, Kevin. I want to pick up on the topic of green growth and the green economy. And for okay. those that don't know, green economy is an economy whose growth in terms of income and employment is driven by public and private investment that fosters innovation and committed to reducing carbon emissions and pollutions, enhancing energy and resources efficiency, and preventing the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services. So yeah, there, there, there's an immediate link for brands in this particular topic as well, because the purpose aspect we talk about, the standing for something true, some of the points that we've covered in, in, in our conversation on influences today, brands have a role to play in contributing to ensuring that we have green growth and a green economy. But the environment and the, the government ecosystem, political ecosystem also has a big role to play 
to ensure that brands can actually operate in that environment to make that contribution. So yeah, uh, a really, a really great chat and, and looking to see what it means for consumers and brands as well. Yeah, yeah, guys, if you if you are listening to today's uh, chat, um, please join us every week. Craig uh, somehow uh, <laughs> comes up with the most remarkable information, and I sit here with my jaw hanging open, and I'm going, wow, like, uh, you know, and we spoke about marketing in, in or mental health and how uh, what companies are doing, talking about the green growth and the green, green economy next week. So join us for that. Uh, Craig, thank you so much for, for the insights and the information. Uh, I think it's fantastic and uh, really adding value. And as it's happening every week, uh, every Thursday on Eber's Radio at 12 o'clock, um, Craig Pageley, thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin.